So welcome to the video workshop series. Uh, today's talk is on the computational linguistic methods and analysis for C-SPAN video research. So this workshop is hosted by the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement in the Advanced Methods at Purdue in the Behavioral Health and Social Sciences. Um, these workshops are designed to inspire researchers to explore innovative research methods and analysis and understands new ways to use video resources, including the C-SPAN video library. Uh, our featured speaker today is Dr. Gloria Gennaro, who is an assistant professor in public policy and data sciences at the University of College London. Previously, Dr. Gennaro was a postdoctoral fellow at the Public Policy Group and Immigration Policy Lab in Zurich. She holds a PhD in social and political sciences from Bukoni uh, University. Her research in comparative political economy explores electoral behavior in democratic society using causal inference and computational social science. And as somebody who read this paper prior to inviting Dr. Gennaro to present as part of our series, I am especially excited about seeing this project in person because the paper is quite good. So I will turn it over to Gloria. Uh, she has asked that uh, if you're interested in having clarifying comments uh, during the course of her talk, please just post those into chat and then I will uh, bring those to her attention as they arise. Gloria, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bryce, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming today and for having me um, here. Uh, I'm very, very glad to be presenting this uh, this work uh, to this crowd specifically, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, we were inspired by Bryce's work. So, so it's actually pretty good uh, that we're uh, presenting this here. Um, so this work is joined with Elliot uh, Ash, my co author at ETH, yeah. and is about. Um, is about the effect of C-SPAN on uh, uh, rhetoric in parliament, basically, uh, and in, in Congress specifically. So, um, you know, well, I guess this crowd, everybody would know what C-SPAN is, but basically when C-SPAN started uh, televising floor speeches for Congress, it was in 1979, and the very first speech that was ever televised through C-SPAN was uh, from Representative Al Gore, who, you know, immediately kind of, you know, try to take some um, position about the fact that television was now uh, present in Congress. And um, I think there is, uh, someone is not on mute. Okay, all right. Um, and basically the idea was that, you know, uh, it was immediately clear that television was going to change somehow the institutions. Um, Algar was pretty positive about that, and he said that, you know, um, the good will far out with the bad, but it was clear immediately as well that there was some trade-off involved in the fact that now you have, you know, people who can watch uh, while you're talking uh, in Congress. And there are many ways in which you can think systematically about this type of questions, and I think as, you know, people are interested in uh, uh, political science, uh, we do have some good tools to think about these problems. And in particular, there are a lot of theories around the effect of transparency on accountability. So electoral uh, models of transparency and accountability would, such that, would suggest that as uh, voters can observe uh, politicians more easily with lower uh, uh, transaction costs, then this should improve accountability. They should be able to basically help uh, politicians accountable in the next elections for their action. And this should induce some sort of discipline. Um, and politicians should behave better somehow, put more effort, respect more uh, the uh, political preferences of the constituency, so on and so forth. Now, a more uh, recent set of models uh, and of theoretical advances in, in this field actually suggest that suggest sorry, that there might be some distortions, right? It's not uh, just so simple that you increase transparency, by which I really mean you increase the observability of politicians' action, and then this will uh, inevitably induce better accountability. One, one particularly interesting angle, I think, that um, illuminates you know, so what might happen in the case of CISPAN is the distinction between uh, higher transparency on the outcomes of the policy process, so on the policy proposals, on the implemented policies, uh, et cetera, 
versus more transparency on the process of deliberation. So the whole process, the decision-making process that uh, is needed to, uh, in the end, achieve some specific outcomes. And in this paper, uh, Pratt in 2005, suggests that you know, higher transparency in outcomes would indeed approve accountability because then voters can actually compare the realized outcomes to their own bliss points, right? To their own uh, policy preferences or to the expectation that they form around the policy process. On the other hand, increasing transparency on the process of deliberation, so on the, you know, series of meetings, discussions that lead to some final decision might actually give a very noisy signal of what's going to be in the end the policy outcome that is what as voters you ultimately probably care about but instead will offer politicians a window of opportunity to uh, basically appeal to voters right and so in this case the process instead of being then uh, aimed at uh, a good policy outcome could be distorted and used instead to just appeal to voters now, when we think about C-SPAN, you might think that this uh, increased transparency uh, probably affects both outcomes and processes, right? So when we have C-SPAN, C-SPAN basically transmits uh, everything that happens, floor debates uh, in Congress without, uh, without any major uh, editing process, um, compared at least to you know, alternative cable, uh, cable networks. And so it offers really an extensive coverage on the process of the decision making, um, sorry, on the decision making process, uh, especially when comparing it to alternative uh, TV news that you might receive. Uh, it offers live coverage from in the House uh, since 1979 and then in the Senate since uh, 1968. And it actually reaches out quite a good share of uh of uh, of american citizens and i was personally surprised uh by this number but you know there are different surveys that have been conducted over time and it basically points to you know um having like a, a roughly between 9 to 15 percent you know that changes over time of u.s population being a regular um a regular viewer of c-span so we do talk about you know a significant chunk of the population and this is beyond of course all the different ways in which c-span material is used by other networks um in in other ways this audience is also uh quite balanced in terms of ideology it's also balanced in terms of gender actually in other characteristics tend to be slightly younger uh, than uh, the average um, than the average population. And so this really, you know, it's very likely to offer like a big opportunities for politicians to actually try to cater to this audience in a way that was uh, previously not accessible. And this seems pretty obvious if you look at quotes from people who were like the kind of, you know, political, important political figure at the time, uh, Newt Grinch, for, in, Green, Green, which, for instance, who was like pretty prominent Republican politician uh, at the time, makes a very clear statement about the role of C-SPAN. Uh, and it says that, you know, they discovered immediately that there was an audience who wanted to follow uh, politics without editing. And I'll, it really, I mean, this idea of not having any editing in between seems to be pretty, uh, pretty important. You know, or more nuanced views probably, you know, from uh, from journalists reflecting again on what happened with CISPAN point roughly in the same direction though. So um, so for instance, the Atlantic had this uh, nice um, review of uh, you know what happened since the creation of CISPAN a few years ago, um, and they say that as basically the ability to speak on TV uh, makes politics less about achieving things and more about scoring points. And here again, right. Going back to the idea that you might have transparency on outcomes or transparency on the process, CISPAN seems really to be, you know, um, to have, you know, an effect on uh, on or, or making more uh, the process more transparent while the outcomes are not necessarily so. So, what should we expect if this is true? If CISPAN is actually, you know, opening up a window uh, for politicians to speak to the public? And uh, and actually not you know distorting a process that was meant to achieve goals into a process that uh, is meant to scoring points with the electorate. Well, one thing we should definitely expect 
is that emotional appeals in public speeches would go up. There is, you know, huge literature around why uh, politicians use uh, emotional rhetoric in their speeches. We know that people that um, that are addressed with more emotional rhetoric change their evaluate, evaluation of policies of politicians themselves. This tend to have, you know, um, more resonance in uh, in social media and actually rights work uh, should be added to the list here. Uh, so there are a number of ways in which you can think, you know, emotional appeals matter, but for sure, you know, as uh, C-SPAN increases viewership for your speech, that's, you know, one of the first things that should, uh, that you would expect uh, there to happen. So the, basically the question for this project is really, you know, does C-SPAN increase emotional appeals? And uh, the type of measure that we're gonna use, and I'm gonna be uh, more specific on that, uh, of emotional appeal is kind of, create some sort of trade-off between, you know, a more emotional language and a more logical argumentation. So the question really is, you know, does this fan increase emotional appeals relative to uh, more logical argumentation? And we uh, try to get at this question by using a text-based measure of emotionality in those congressional speeches. Uh, so we take basically the universe of congressional speeches in the last uh, years that are relevant for the C-SPAN analysis and we use and we look at measures of emotionality in the transcripts of those uh, of those speeches. We observed the C-SPAN increased emotionality when it was introduced in the House compared to the Senate by exploiting you know, a simple diff in diff the, and the fact that C-SPAN was first introduced in the House in 79 and only later on in the Senate in 86. And we then also show that um, if we look at politicians who come from different electoral districts, those electoral districts where C-SPAN has higher viewership will tend to have politicians who speak more emotionally. So we do find a direct link between the action of a given politician in Congress and some, expect, you know, some reasonable expectation about the, the amount of viewership that uh, that speech will receive. We then move to think about, you know, okay, but what about accountability, right? So, uh, it's nice that, you know, to find an effect of ceasefire and emotionality. This doesn't mean that accountability is also not effective. And so we go back to this idea of mediated and unmediated transparency. We try to compare the effect of C-SPAN and newspaper, and newspaper being a very, you know, highly mediated type of, uh, type of transparency on accountability measures. And we'll, and I'll show to you that basically not only newspapers per se do not increase emotionality in Congress, which I think is a kind of a sanity check, that's what you would expect. But at the same time, we also don't find any effect of C-SPAN on improving measures of effort uh, that respondents send to the newspaper. And finally, the very newest part of this project, that's the first time we present, um, we try to understand a little bit a little bit back, a little bit better the mechanism behind this whole process. And what we have in mind is that now politicians can speak to the public. And so somehow they will try to use this occasion to maximize their electoral returns. And so we want to understand, you know, whether politicians respond to this fund precisely because they have higher electoral incentives. And I'll show to you that we find that the effect of C-SPAN on emotional speech is stronger in, in, uh, in electoral districts uh, that are, um, is stronger among members who come from electoral districts that are very competitive as opposed to safe districts. And I'll also show to you that this, the exposure to this fund seems to have uh, a positive effect on vouchers for the incumbent and more so for incumbents who use more emotional speech. And so all in all, the the, you know, what we have in mind is that actually, indeed, you know, being exposed to C-SPAN is a great occasion for a politician to try to start engaging in more emotional rhetoric. And this indeed leads to some electoral rewards. All right. Um, so this is basically everything that I'm going to tell you in detail now. Um, but before we go there, I want to take a, a step back and talk a little bit more about the measure of emotionality that we're gonna use. This is very important, of course, to understand our results right now, but I also understand that um, this audience was interested a little bit more in understanding the methods behind uh, the um, behind this paper. And so I was like, um, 
I try to give you a little bit of insights uh, into what we do. Um, if you have any clarifying question, don't hesitate uh, to ask. So uh, as I mentioned, this paper is really a follow-up of some previous work that we had and is now published on how to measure emotionality from text. And in particular, uh, taking as case study, basically, uh, the American Congress. Now, what we do in that, in that project uh, that provides our outcome variable here, basically, is to take the universe of floor speeches uh, in the US Congress uh, between 1858 and, uh, uh, and 2014, so the most recent ones. Um, and we, you know, exclude everything that is non-speech, so like reading of pieces of legislation. Um, and we are left with a pretty you know, significant uh, number of speeches that have been pronounced in the House and in the Senate over time. We use some pretty standard pre-processing text to try to simplify a little bit, you know, to reduce the dimensionality of the text, to simplify the corpus. And so we drop punctuation capitalization numbers, stop words. Um, I'm happy to go into details of this in the Q&A if you're interested. I'll be a bit fast here. And what we're left with is like, you know, a series of speeches that have been simplified, cleared up uh, and reduced to the most essential components. Now with that, now we are left with the question, how do you measure emotionality? There are many ways that you, there are many approaches you could take to this question. And uh, some of the most standard ones are based on some sort of word frequency count. So essentially what happens typically is that you have some dictionaries of words that have some, you know, that are emotionally charged in some way. Think about happy, overjoyed, right? And this word will count, will basically count uh, towards some, you know, sort of in measure of intensity of emotionality in a speech. Now, of course, this type of approach is, uh, is very transparent and it's actually simple to apply. It has some problems uh, clearly. And, and, you know, and one of the biggest one is that it's really dependent on the vocabularies that you choose, right? So if you take uh, a dictionary of emotive, um, of emotive words, everything that is not included in your dictionary will not be counted towards your final uh, measure of emotionality. A second typical problem of this type of approaches is that, uh, you know, words that have different intensity, I mean, there are ways around that, but very often words that have different intensity tend to be, tend to count the same. So again, think about happy and overjoyed, this will count, um, you know, to your emotionality measure by the same amount. So what we try to do is to um, is to overcome basically all of this, uh, and this was particularly important in the context of those congressional speeches where um, you know there is a huge time span and language variation over time uh, create you know, exacerbates this kind of issues. So we use word embedding instead, and uh, for those of you who are not like very familiar with word embeddings, this is just an algorithm that allows you to transform. Uh, language into a vector representation. The idea behind that is that you can understand the meaning of a word by the words that appear in its context more frequently. And so really the starting point is try to understand what type of words appear close to each other more frequently. And the algorithm uh, creates, the output of the algorithm are word vectors such that this objective function here is minimized. If you don't care about word, about, about word embedding, you can like switch off your brain for a second and come back like in three minutes. So don't worry too much. But um, so what happens here is simply that you know um, you initialize your word vector with some uh, with some initial values, and then the algorithm tries to minimize the square distance between the dot. I mean the the product of those word vectors and the matrix of coincidences. At the end of the day, what you're going to have are word vectors that really represent the co-occurrence of words, right? So for two words that appear very frequently uh, close to each other, these two words will have corresponding word vectors whose dot product is very high. So what we're capturing really here, you know, in the end of the day are co-occurrences. Now, once you have uh, those word vectors, you can use them as, you know, any 
you know, vector in, in a vectorial space, and you can use linear algebra to understand the relationship between those vectors. And some key characteristics of this word in body space is going to be that distances, uh, by which I mean really, you know, the angle between two vectors, will encode semantic meaning. So take this example here in the picture. If you take two words like dog and cat that have more related meaning to each other as you know, with respect to a word like cat and car, for instance, then they, the, the word you know, dog and cat will tend to appear closer to each other in the word embedded space as opposed to cat and car. And the typical metric to, uh, to study then, um, well, to, to measure uh, closeness in the bedding and more than space, it's just going to be the cosine similarity that is a normalized dot product between these two vectors. So the closer uh, two word vectors to each other, the more similar their meaning will be. And this is really the main intuition that you need to have to understand what happens in this paper. So we take all this machinery into the paper, and what we try to do is to apply it to our problem. This is measure um, emotion on the one hand and reason on the other. So the affective content of, uh, of text versus the logical content of text. So we take some seed dictionaries. So once we have trained our word embedding space, and so now we have a vector representation of language in Congress over the full time period, we try to find within this, uh, within the word embedding space, two uh, poles, right? Two anchors for our concept of emotion on the one hand and reason on the other. So we take two seed dictionaries that come from social psychology that have been extensively validated and used in social science research, the Lewick dictionaries. Uh, one dictionary refers to cognitive processing, such as causation, comparison, inclusion, exclusion. The second one refers to affective processing. Uh, and so, you know, positive and negative emotions, anxiety, anger, etc. We pre-process those texts and we represent and we basically, you know, find the place of those two dictionaries into our word embedded space. So we project the dictionaries into the space and find the centroid for each of them. And now what we have are like two, you know, point, two vectors, technically, well, two points in this big space that represent the centroid of emotions and the centroid of cognitive language. And now to have a sense that we are not really, you know, <laughs> that we're doing something that makes sense, what you find on the left here are uh, words that do not belong to our dictionary, but they appear close, uh, that appear very close to the emotion centroid divided up into positive and negative sentiments just for illustration and you see words like you know smile uh thrill terrified frightened on the other hand what you see are like those words that appear closest to the uh, reason centroid and if you remember i told you this is something about you know, inclusion exclusion causation etc and you find indeed words like imply infer discern analytics, uh, et cetera. So the very last step of this, uh, of this process is to try to relate the speeches. This is what ultimately we want to do, to relate those speeches to this idea of emotion on one hand and cognition. And now the task is actually pretty easy. What we just need to do is to find, you know, the representation of each speech in the word embedding space and then find the cosine similarity with respect to the emotion and the cognition centroids. Uh, so we find the document vector. That's just a, basically a weighted average of, uh, of each word that appear in a given document. And we can use this vector as mentioned, you know, like we can take the, the, the cosine similarity between the document vector and the effect or the cognition centroid. And so the final measure that we use uh, in that paper that we use as outcome in, in this work on C-SPAN is really a relative uh, measure uh, of closeness of each document to the effect centroid on the one hand and the cognition centroid on the other. So we basically take really the ratio between the cosine similarity of the document vector and the effect centroid and the document vector and the cognition centroid. So the higher the measure, the higher the closeness of our, um, of our speech to the effect centroid, the higher the emotional content of that speech. 
All right. Okay, so these are some examples of sentences that score very high or very low uh, in emotionality, which means, you know, very high in emotionality or very high in cognitive uh, processing. And so you see among the most effective sentences, um, you know, some praising, uh, some colleague who fought for years, etc., etc. There are a lot of praising of colleagues or praising of American soldiers uh, among those type of sentences. On the other hand, you tend to have very legalistic, you know, or procedural type of language. And here we are really looking, you know, at the extreme uh, values of emotion and cognition. I'm happy to talk about the human validation we do probably in the Q&A because of, uh, otherwise uh, it's gonna take a long time. Um, so I think the main chart from that paper was this one. And that was really the point where we got inspired for writing our second paper. So when you plot now this uh, measure of emotion uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, in the Congress uh, by chambers, so the Senate in red and House, in, uh, in green, that's what you observe. So there are some spikes that correspond to, you know, this is, of course, you know, everything is exposed here, right? So we look at the spikes and we're like, this makes sense, right? There is, you know, this corresponds to some war events, et cetera, et cetera. What we were really, uh, you know, interested in were this huge increase in the level of emotionality starting in the late seventies. And what you see here is that at some point the house uh, starts, you know, uh, increasing in in the use of emotional language dramatically, and that the Senate follows basically a little bit later. And we hypothesize in that paper that there might be uh, some effects, you know, just by temporal sequencing, basically, that there might be uh, some um, effect of C-SPAN that drastically change kind of the structure of incentives of people speaking in the house around that point in time. Okay, and so it was a long way, but here we are. Um, so what we do, you know, like when we saw these trends, we were like, we have to write a paper about CISPAN and see whether this is true, right? If this, we can actually validate this in a more um, rigorous way. And so we started really from that plot and that plot suggests that you might have, you know, a case for doing a difference in difference analysis where, we use uh, where the fact that this, that CISPAN was introduced in the House in 79 and only much later, you know, later on in the Senate in 86 can give a good opportunity to use the Senate as a, as a counterfactual basically of the House of Representatives. So we estimate a simple different gift where the outcome variable is emotionality in a given speech, in a given chamber, in a given year. Um, and where you know the main regressor is a dummy for the house uh, versus and zero for the senate, and then leads and lags around the year of the introduction of CISPAN in the House of Representatives, and this will give us you know the pretrends, an idea of the pretrends and you know possible effects of CISPAN. So what we find uh, is basic, basically this is the main result of this diff-in-diff uh, analysis. Um, so 1978, the vertical line here is just the last year where CISPAN was really not there, right? So it was nowhere uh, near the house, all right? So if you look at what happens before that, you observe basically null, null uh, yeah, coefficients that are not distinguishable from zero, which suggests that, you know, despite being on different levels of emotionality and the house being always a little bit more emotional than the Senate, the two were basically on similar trends. So the, the house was not already on higher emotionality trends before the introduction of CISPAN. Now, after the CISPAN is introduced, we start observing some picking up. So CISPAN is introduced in March in 1979 specifically. And then in uh, 1981, you have the very first, um, the very first uh, Congress uh, that is elected under this new regime, right? Under new CISPAN. Uh, and this is where you really start seeing a you know stark difference between uh, the House and the um, and the Senate. Um, we have some additional analysis that uh, we can go over in the QA that suggests that indeed it is a selection effect. So it, there was not much adaptation of you know previous uh, House members um, 
who just starts, you know, speaking more emotionally because his funny is there, but rather most of the effect comes really from newly elected um, Congress member that seems to be using more emotionality on average. Now, of course, this effect, right, uh, can be uh, confounded in many different ways. Many things might happen in uh, 1978, 79, uh, that might um, explain why we have this picking up in emotional language that's not CISPAN per se. And more importantly, I think what, uh, what this does not tell us really is what is the role of viewership, right? So in our mind, uh, what happens here is that, you know, uh, you are a politician in the house, and now you think that you have some viewership at home and you want uh, to, to exploit this window and talk to them. So we try to get at that question with our second uh, analysis. Uh, and we really try to estimate the effect of viewership of CISPAN in the home district of a given congressman on his or her use of emotional speech in Congress. And this will corroborate the effect, you know, the results of the definitive, but also uh, more importantly, give us a little bit of an idea of the mechanism behind this effect. Now, of course, um, the key identification challenge here is that districts uh, that where people watch CISPAN more often will also elect different type of politicians. So there are certain district characteristics. Think about, you know, the education of the level of education of the population, the type, you know, the skill base of the, of the labor force that might affect both the viewership of CISPAN and the type of politicians that you elect, including their use of emotional rhetoric. And so what we do is to try to find some exogenous variation in the viewership of CISPAN uh, that might, you know, isolate essentially um, the effect of the, the causal effect of watching CISPAN by chance, and, and I'll be more precise uh, on that, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, emotionality in Congress. So we use an instrument uh, that has been now used quite a lot, uh, I would say, uh, in, uh, in this type of literature, that is the channel position that CISPAN has on the channel lineup uh, in a given, uh, the average channel position in a given district. Now, the idea here is that when you watch TV, you most of the time start from the bottom and then just, you know, switch, uh, basically, you know, surf upward, right? You switch channel by going up, up and up. And so what happens is that if the channel position, if a given, if a given channel has, is very low in the channel position, then uh, this channel will be watched more just because it is, it has a lower number. Um, now, importantly, you know, the channel position uh, really depends on, uh, on, some, um, on some factors that relate to when the media producer decided to join the local cable network. And this is mostly fixed over time. It can change only if some uh, producer decides to drop uh, from the network and at that point, you know, things are shifted. But there is basically no agency, there is no possibility at the beginning nor throughout, you know, the whole time period we look at for a media producer to say, no, I want to be number five, right, versus I want to be number 20. Uh, and people cannot really, you know, uh, change the channel position on their TV set. So somehow this, you know, number, this, the lineup in the channel position gives you some reasonably exogenous variation in the number of people that would watch C-SPAN. Now, of course, our compliers, so the people who watch C-SPAN just because it is low in the channel position will be, you know, a specific type of people. And what we're really estimated is, you know, is uh, the effect of uh, the channel position on those people, who, on those districts that where people watch more C-SPAN just because it is low in the channel position. So we take the data from Nielsen, uh, we take viewership data for 2004 and the channel position for a longer time period, to, uh, 1998 to 2004, which was a bad investment because basically it doesn't change. So it would have been just better to take 2004. Uh, but well, we take now that we have all of it, we just take the average. Um, and we aggregate to the congressional district level. These data come at the level of the counties. So you need some, you know, population weighting to aggregate this at the district. 
level. And we merge this data with um, the floor species in the house between um, 1998, so the beginning of our channel position um, data set to 2014. That is all we have basically. We estimate uh, a, a, an IV regression, a two-stage least square, where the first stage is the effect of uh, C-SPAN channel position, Z, on C-SPAN viewership, B. And the second stage is the effect of the instrumented uh, viewership on uh, emotionality in, uh, in Congress. And happy to go more into the details of those if you like. Uh, importantly, we introduce fixed effect for state times year. Okay, so what we are really doing is comparing congressional districts that are in the same state in the same year. All right, the first stage uh, is not obvious uh, to, you know, this instrument has been used before, but mostly for uh, cable news like Fox News, for instance, where um, you know, you might think that that you know viewership is higher on average, and then the instrument have a bigger effect. Uh, so the first thing we did is to try to see whether it was a first stage, whether it is true that having a lower channel position, people indeed watch more C-SPAN just because the channel position is low. And this is what we find: we find that as the channel position of C-SPAN goes up, the viewership of C-SPAN in the district goes down. So people seem to be responding to this instrument just in the same way as they respond to the channel position of Fox News, for instance. The reduced form gives you the effect of the channel position on emotionality directly. Um, and so, and what you see here already is that higher, you know, higher channel position, less C-SPAN viewership corresponds to less emotional speeches of the congressman who was elected in that given electoral congress. And of course, now, you know, the two stage least square uh, regression um, gives you, well, basically, you know, now results that are very much expected. So the first column is just the regression of emotionality on C-SPAN viewership. So just, you know, the endogenous regressor, basically. Uh, we find a positive correlation, even though not significant. And then as soon as you introduce uh, the instrument, well, basically what we find is you know, a strong, uh, robust and stable correlation of and stable uh, effect of C-SPAN viewership on uh, the use of emotionality in uh, the congressman that is affected by this, uh, by this instrument. Now the magnitude here, everything is standardized. So like a one standard deviation increase in viewership corresponds to 0.3 um, standard deviation increase in emotionality. So I want to drive your attention only on the last uh, couple of um, couple of um, columns here. Like in column two to six, uh, we just introduced you know local district characteristics that are somehow in some cases related correlated with C-SPAN channel position. And so it's important to include them and you see that nothing really changes. Like what we do in the last two columns instead is to introduce endogenous, but potentially endogenous regressors, right? We include other speech characteristics, the sophistication, for instance, of a given speech, and we introduce the topics. And in particular, when you see, uh, when we introduce the topic, what happens is that the coefficient, the coefficient goes down. So somehow part of this, you know, of the of the effect of C-SPAN on emotionality in general goes through a change in the topic that people decide to uh, to address in Congress, um, and you know, a, a shift towards more emotional topics uh, in general. All right. For sake of time, I'll skip all of this. So we do a lot of robustness test, uh, we do a lot of placebos. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about this in the Q&A if you have, uh, if you have uh, any, any question. Um, we actually run you know, additional results that give a little bit of uh, a sense of what happens you know, more broadly. Uh, something interesting is that we use the channel position of other, other uh, cable news um, networks. Uh, to try to perform the same analysis. And we do find a small effect of increased uh, emotionality uh, for uh, uh, most of the cable news network, but the effect is much, much lower. 
uh, we don't find any effect of um, the of the channel position for non news networks instead. Um, we don't find any effect on the selection of politicians, which I think we were surprised. Uh, but you know, we uh, try to understand whether in places where uh, C-SPAN is as higher viewership, we also see a selection on on, gen on gender, age, race, religions. We don't find much. We do find a small effect on education. Uh, but you know, this uh, is very yeah. We're not sure whether to draw big conclusion uh, from that. All right, so I think I, I hope I convinced you a little bit that CISPAN did have an effect in, incre in increasing um, the use of emotionality uh, in Congress by those congressmen who were directly affected because they have more people watching CISPAN in their home district. Now, the next question was, does this also increase accountability? Because ultimately, you know, what we probably care about mostly is whether you know, in response to, to C-SPAN, people also work more hard, right? Or they respect better constituency preferences. And so here we go back to this idea of mediated and direct transparency, where we think about C-SPAN as an exceptionally, you know, un, uh, direct channel of communication between politicians and voters, due to the fact that there is, you know, very little editing uh, going on. On the other hand, you know, on the opposite uh, probably spectrum of this mediated versus direct transparency, we find newspapers that, of course, you know, have uh, have a large role in in editing content uh, from Congress, and in particular, we are interested in the role of newspapers because probably the best evidence we have about the effect of uh, transparency on accountability comes from a paper uh, that looks precisely at uh, local uh, newspaper markets, uh, Snyder and Stromberg 2010. So what they do and what we will exploit in this analysis is to look at uh, the congruence between local media markets and electoral districts. The idea being that if the boundaries of these two you know, are, are closely matched, basically, you're gonna have, um, there's going to be an alignment of interest, basically, between uh, local voters and the captive audience for these newspapers. And so the higher the correspondence between uh, the local media market and the electoral district, the more likely it is that local newspaper will cover local politicians, because their audience will most likely be local voters. On the other hand, if the two boundaries do not correspond, if one local media market covers, for instance, three electoral districts, well, in that case, what you're going to have is less coverage of any given specific local politicians and more coverage about other news. Uh, so we use the same instrument that they use. We basically take their data set, right? And we look at um, how does uh, coverage through newspapers affect um, emotionality on the one hand. And the question is, does it also increase emotionality? Um, and then we take basically, again, the measure of congruence and the measure of C-SPAN um, channel position to understand the effect of both on accountability, bearing in mind that what their paper is about is that there is an effect of media market congruence on accountability. So first of all, we find no effect of uh, media market congruence, so higher coverage of local politicians by uh, local newspapers on emotionality in Congress of those of those uh, congressmen, I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think for us is more of a sanity check when speech is mediated through the filters of a journalist writing in a newspaper. There is no incentive for uh, the politicians to engage uh, fully with um, more emotional rhetoric. There is no TV through which watch you know through which your home district can watch you. On the other hand, we can confirm that there is an effect of, of local newspapers on efforts measured uh, as witnesses' appearances, as Nedren Stromberg do in that paper. And this is column one and two. In column three and four, we show that we don't find instead any effect of CFAN channel position and so viewership on, uh, on any measure of effort. 
A second measure that they use um, in their paper is party loyalty, the idea being that uh, congressmen were very loyal to uh, their party hierarchies. They will vote less in line with local constituencies, and so higher party loyalties means less constituency orientation, basically. We can, you know, we again, we, you know, in our data set, we basically, in our sample, we confirm their finding that higher media congruence reduces party loyalty and hence in their reading of this paper, of these results, increases constituency orientation. Again, we find no effect whatsoever on CISPAN. Very last one, a direct measure of constituency orientation by the choice of um, committee membership that politicians uh, make. Again, we find, we confirm that higher newspaper coverage seems to increase constituency orientation. But we do, but we basically, we, we find a very small effect that is not robust though to the inclusion of controls uh, for the effect of, you know, CISPAN channel position on constituency orientation. So basically, you know, until now the picture is CISPAN increases emotionality in Congress, but does not seem to increase accountability by the same, you know, in the same way. On the other hand, we have, you know, newspapers that seems to be increasing accountability, just confirming other people's results, but do not have any effect on rhetoric, which is again, some sort of sanity check in our, to our case, I think. The last piece, um, the last piece I want to give you is about what we think is the mechanism driving uh, all of this. Okay, so why do we observe uh, higher emotionality in Congress when CISPAN um, starts transmitting from uh, from Congress? Well, again, you know what we have in mind is that CISPAN provides some window uh, for politicians to communicate directly to voters. And so what we want to understand is whether electoral incentives are driving all of this, okay? Um, and so if what politicians have in mind when they are talking now under this new C-SPAN um, reality is, okay, I should be emotional because then voters in my home districts will react to that more strongly. So we do two main tests, basically. The first one is a simple heterogeneity. And we look at the effect of CISPAN on emotionality, like the main analysis, but a separate for districts where, where um, electoral incentives are supposed to be stronger, so competitive districts, and uh, for districts that are considered to be safe. And we define that, uh, I mean, this is, you know, is robust to many definitions of what is a competitive district. We define it as uh, a district where uh, Republican or Democrat do not have historical majorities, basically. So in the 10 years before the beginning of our study, we look at whether they have an average vote share of more than 60%. The second test is, um, is to look at the effect of C-SPAN exposure on the vote share for those congressmen who speak in Congress and differentially so for congressmen who use a lot of emotional speech or not. The idea here is that if congressmen are rational, right, and they're thinking rationally about the electoral rewards that they might that they might enjoy while uh, talking more emotionally on C-SPAN, then we should see an effect of C-SPAN on vote shares for the incumbent, and more so for people who actually use emotionality more. And you know, and very briefly, this is just you know what we find. So we find that when we split the sample between speeches uh, pronounced by congressmen who run in competitive districts, we find an effect of C-SPAN channel position. So this is a negative because you know higher channel position, lower viewership, then less emotionality, right? Uh, and we don't find any effect on safe districts. The difference between the two samples is statistically significant, as you can see in the third, uh, in the third column. When we look at the effect of C-SPAN uh, channel position again uh, on the vote share for people in Congress, 
What we find again is that higher channel position, lower viewership means lower vote shares for people in Congress. So again, on the other hand, you know, higher C-SPAN viewership results in higher vote shares for people in Congress. When you split the sample between uh, people who used in the previous legislature um, a level of emotionality that is below or above the median, we find the magnitude to be uh, and to be stronger for people who use higher uh, emotionality and the effect is more precisely estimated. All right, uh, I've been talking for an hour, but <laughs> about <clears throat> this paper, I hope you're, you're all still with me. But basically to sum up uh, what we find um, in this paper is to try to understand the effect of C-SPAN on, uh, on rhetoric and effort in Congress. And we look at, you know, the effect of C-SPAN in increasing emotionality in the House compared to the Senate when C-SPAN was first introduced. And then in you know, the effect of C-SPAN on the use of emotional speeches by congressmen who come from district where C-SPAN is watched more uh, because of some exogenous um, shifter. So we find that C-SPAN, um, you know, the, the transparency that we achieved through C-SPAN seems to be very different from the type of transparency that we could have achieved, that we could have achieved, that we can, we still achieve, right? Through newspapers. In particular, it seems that C-SPAN increases um, emotional rhetoric that we think of as a signal of pandering to local audiences, but does not seem to affect effort. On the other hand, we find that newspapers did not change emotional rhetoric, probably unsurprisingly, but they seem to have uh, had you know, a positive effect on effort and constituency orientation. Um, if when we think about the reasons behind that, uh, we find some you know, support, strong supportive evidence for uh, the effect of, you know, for there being some electoral pressure behind, uh, behind the use of emotionality in Congress, uh, where basically you know, the use of emotional language is expected to increase uh, electoral rewards and being amplified by the fact that CISPAN is now transmitting their speech. And this all you know, suggests that probably we should think a little bit more critically about, um, about methods for achieving uh, more of achieving transparency that resonates with this idea that you know transparency is good, but also might introduce some distortion. So, you know, some more thought probably is needed in that direction. All right, this is all I have. Um, and let me say that we're going to publish the working paper in a couple of days, I think. <laughs> so you'll see this very soon. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gennaro. Uh, I'm going to give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. So we have a, a few moments for some uh, questions that you may have about the, the presentation uh, before we get to the Q&A, just in case people have to run out ASAP, uh, I'm going to put our Twitter handle uh, as well as Instagram handle at Center for C-SPAN into chat. Um, all future talks in the series will be publicized there. And please stick around after the Q&A. We'll talk about what's coming up in the series for the remainder of the semester uh, if you're interested. Uh, so with that, I'm going to manage the Q&A. So you can either post a question into chat or you could raise your hand and then I will call on people and ask them to unmute their mic uh, if they're raising their hand, or I will read your question aloud. I certainly have a few of my own, but I will open it up to the floor. Yes, we'll start with uh, Jesse. Go ahead. Hi, Gloria. Thank you so much for this presentation. I mean, this is like, you said working paper. It reads more like a working book. I mean, it's an absolute like tour de force here. It's really impressive. Um, I, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'll I'll narrow it down to one that I think ties together uh, th uh, that that the thread goes through multiple of your analyses, which is and in this it's possible this is a it almost certain it's a it's a follow up paper, but I just wanted to get your sense of what you think here. To what extent are these differences in emotion driven not by people talking differently about the same topics, but by talking about policy as opposed to non-policy constituency service uh, and so on and so forth. I noticed in one slide that we had to go over pretty quickly that, that tributes went down, 
that national narrative went up. Um, and so I'm just curious how much of the emotionality is driven by that kind of thing. And I think this is especially important just as a Congress scholar for me to make sense of these um, findings sort of in light of the stuff that Grimmer did with, uh, you know, how marginal members of Congress shift their communication strategies away from policy entirely, uh, you know, in an effort to um, appeal to a larger swath of, of constituents. Yeah, thanks. That's excellent. Should I answer um, to yeah, that? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So um, we were, uh, that was really an empirical question for us. Um, you know, whether you just change the way in which you talk about things or if you change what you talk about entirely. I think we find a little bit of evidence of both uh, in this paper. And as you mentioned, uh, we find basically an increase in what we call national relative, which basically is, uh, you know, they talk about the American dream, but they also talk about soldiers abroad. Um, and we find like a strong increase in that, uh, in that direction. So definitely there is some, you know, movement towards um, what I would say probably, um, a, a, you know, less controversial kind of, you know, more broadly appealing sense of nation and unity. Um, we don't find much, uh, so I have uh, this table somewhere, uh, but I, if I recall correctly, we don't find a lot of changes uh, across policy topics. So we would have expected probably, uh, you know, some shift away from some policy topics in favor of others, and we didn't find any anything major there. Uh, so it's most likely what happens is that people start talking about, you know, these kind of broad issues um and at the margin increasing their emotionality on the on the policy topics that we're already treating before thanks thanks uh caleb go ahead yes so thinking mostly about the recent debacle with with the uh speaker vote um i was wondering um if this work could be um incorporated into sort of studies specifically centered on the way that C-SPAN covers certain events as the the way that the House vote was covered differs from like I say, a regular um, committee meeting or a uh, vote. Thank you. Yeah, I think you made an excellent point. We never talk about, we, so we make a lot of abstractions, I think in this paper uh, about, um, the way in which this fund covers uh, things. We just say it is definitely less mediated than other uh, TV networks that I think is like a plausible um, assumption to take. Now you could think that there is variation uh, in, in coverage also within CISPAN and this is something that we are not uh, exploiting at all at the moment. And uh, yeah, and I think it would be interesting actually. So one could think about, um, you know, what are kind of, um, how could I say that nicely? <laughs> you know, deviations from this uh, um, unmediated um, approach to coverage uh, that I think has characterized this fun if you if you compare it to other other networks. But yeah, more food for thought, I think. Uh, Robert, go ahead. Um, I want to ask about. Um channel position how how is that a uh, constant versus variation by cable system yeah so basically um for old networks uh it is almost contest contest uh sorry constant over time uh it varies a little bit more for uh you know younger networks and most of the variation is really uh geographical so that's why we basically, in the end, what we do is to take a cross an average, which is uh, for each district, which is fixed in time, uh, and use the cross-sectional variation uh, across location. Um, it's basically, you know, like once you decide to join the local cable network, you're gonna give in the next available position. And if you did that, you know, early on, then basically your channel position rarely changed. So there are a few cases where this changes, but it's like not nearly enough for us to use it as a, 
as an identification strategy. There is not enough variation over time for us to, to be able to use that. I think the very first thing we had in mind is to try to use actually variations over time in channel position, very similar to what Snyder and Stromberg do for their congruence measure, but that was not possible. Did I answer your question? Okay. Excellent, thank I, I put myself into the queue, so I'm gonna go ahead and lower my hand now. Um, so uh, I certainly have some questions regarding uh, emotional measurement, but before you know, we dive into those, um, I think that this is a great project. Um, I think that you're perhaps underselling this paper's contribution. Um, so yes, we care about C-SPAN uh, here at Purdue. Uh, lots of people in the room care about C-SPAN, uh, but filming of institutional settings is more universal than C-SPAN. Uh, specifically, there's a lot of questions about cameras in the courtroom. There's similar questions about cameras at the local level. And so I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about how well do your findings port to other institutional settings? Uh, specifically, the Supreme Court would be one that I would encourage you to engage with in the introduction and the conclusion of the project. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, I think, I think it would be excellent to try uh, to work on the Supreme Court. Uh, I think I've seen some work actually, or I talked to someone working on that in Dublin uh, probably. Um, and I, I can I can look this up uh, and uh, and tell you more about that. But basically, I think it would. Uh, so it will results should uh, be uh, externally valid to the extent that some conditions uh, you know are fulfilled, right? And and essentially, what we have in mind is this electoral um, rewards mechanism. So the electoral incentives. Now. Can you think the Supreme Court has some audience? You can think about electoral incentive as being audience cost more broadly, right? And so I think that if this is true, then you can definitely think about how, you know, uh, cameras in other institutions that maybe do not have, you know, a direct, uh, direct elections like, you know, congressmen in, uh, in the Congress uh, might still be subject to audience cost. Now, I, I guess like the key question would be, you know, who's really the audience of those uh, of those speeches? Now, um, I think this is a question that is true also for C-SPAN in the in Congress, right? So, who are the people who really watch that? Um, you know, who are those who watch it exogenously somehow? You know, who are the compliers? Um, in the case of the of the Supreme Court, I wouldn't I wouldn't know the answer. I think. Um, but you know the way in which I would think about expanding these results to the Supreme Court would be try to understand what are their audience costs uh, and uh, if uh, those costs are related to you know the general public, which I think is you know very arguable. I mean, sorry, very probably true, right? Like me, we can argue for that. Um, then definitely, I would I would expect an effect there. Yeah. I don't know if I answered. That's that's works for me. Thank you. Um, any other questions? We're running a little long on time, so perhaps we should wrap things up. Um, I don't see anybody chopping at the bit. Uh, so let's talk about what is happening the rest of the semester in the video workshop series. So on March 10th, Oliver Rittman, who's currently in the chat, will be presenting a fantastic project which utilizes facial recognition to classify the attentiveness of listeners in the German legislature. Uh, I too am familiar with this project and it kind of assess to the quality of the work. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing Oliver's presentation. Uh, then on April 7th, I will be presenting, but it will be slightly different. So the goal is we have two research presentations, Dr. Gennaro and Oliver's presentation on March 10th. And what we'll be doing on April 7th, it'll be a more of a hands-on tutorial talking about some of the methodology that is presented in both of these presentations. So for uh, Glor uh, Dr. Gennaro's presentation, I'll be talking about word embeddings and emotional classification using text. And then for Oliver's presentation, I will be talking about uh, how to do facial recognition and facial classifications. And that's gonna be very hands-on in the sense that there'll be source code, et cetera, that you can use in your own work potentially port those methodologies for your own practices. Um, 
So uh, with that, I think we can conclude this session. Again, March 10th is our next talk. Registration is going to be circulated on social media starting tomorrow. So please look out for that. And thank you, Dr. Gennaro, for joining us and everybody else for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you on March 10th. Thanks.